In this video, we'll look at different types of study designs that were introduced in video two, and also give examples to make it more clear how they differ from one another. There are many different types of study designs, and they vary based on the quality of the information they produce. For example, the lowest level of evidence is expert opinion. Expert opinion is the lowest level because it's not founded on evidence, but on experience, and human beings tend to be very biased and unreliable in terms of objective assessment. In this pyramid, the higher the study design, the better the level of evidence. Today, we will discuss case reports and series through RCTs. Meta-analyses and systematic reviews are studies which consolidate evidence available from RCTs and observational studies, and they'll be discussed later in the course. Let's start off by looking at an example of a clinical question from medical history to frame our discussion of study designs. So in 1747, a Scottish surgeon in the British Navy, James Lind, wanted to perform a medical experiment in an attempt to cure a devastating disease known as scurvy. At the time, little was known about scurvy, yet Lind was under the assumption that acids could be used as a cure. In the 18th century, British ships had no refrigeration, so sailors ate fruits and vegetables early on in the trips, and it wasn't until later in the voyages that scurvy developed. So based on this, Dr. Lind had hypothesized that one of several treatments could work to cure scurvy, cider, vitrolytic elixir, vinegar, two oranges and a lemon, seawater, or purgative mixture. Randomized control trials are the highest level of evidence for a single study because they involve randomly assigning patients to different treatment groups. This ensures the groups differ on important characteristics, so the confounding variables are less likely. RCTs are analytical. They des they're designed to assess a relationship. They're prospective, investigators assign patients, then follow them forward, and they're experimental because the investigators choose the groups. The only study design that fulfills all three of our causality criteria is the randomized control trial because it's the only study that is a true experiment. So in our scurvy example, what we might do if we wanted to conduct a randomized controlled trial is we would take the British sailors we would randomize them to one of three groups, the one that with the oranges that would receive oranges and lemons, a group that gets seawater, and then a third group that gets the purgative. And then we would follow the patients and see if there was a decrease in scurvy in the fruit group. So why aren't all studies randomized controlled trials? Well, for two reasons, ethics and feasibility. If a treatment is already known to be harmful, it's unethical to randomly assign patients to receive the treatment. For instance, you know, when we're studying cigarettes, alcohol, illicit drugs. And then feasibility. Randomized control trials cost a lot of money, so it's prohibitively expensive to randomize more than 10,000 people or follow patients for long periods of time, for instance, five years or more. Some exposures cannot be randomly assigned. For instance, effects of combat on military personnel, impact of natural disasters. One level down in the quality of evidence is the cohort study in which patients are grouped based on pre-existing exposures and then assessed and compared based on the outcome of interest. Importantly, cohort studies can be retrospective or prospective. So use caution when interpreting the design. Because investigators are not intervening in patients' lives and randomizing patients to the exposures, cohort studies are considered observational. In observational studies, we always need to look at how patients are grouped. Cohort studies group based on exposure. Cohort studies are useful for following large populations for large periods of time and especially useful when RCTs are not feasible. For example, cohort studies can group patients into cigarette smokers and non-smokers and follow them to compare cancer incidents. Unfortunately, cohort studies only fulfill two of our three causal criteria. We know cause precedes effect because we group based on the exposure and follow for the outcome. However, because we're not randomly assigning exposures or interventions, it's not an experiment. So let's say we wanted to run a cohort study on our scurvy example we have a group of British sailors, and we're gonna group them based on exposure. 
So we're going to put a group of sailors that are known to eat lemons into one group, and then a group of sailors that are known to drink lots of cider. Then we're going to follow them forward in time and see if there's a decrease in scurvy among the lemon eaters. Cohort studies are good because they fulfill two of our three causal criteria and compare groups, not just one group, so we can make associations at the individual level. Cohort studies are especially useful when exposures are rare or are unable to be randomized. Weaknesses include the lack of randomization and thus experimentation, and a large potential for selection bias. We'll talk about selection bias next week, but essentially it means that the exposed and unexposed groups differ in many ways that could impact the outcome. For example, smokers may have more heart attacks because they're less educated, have lower socioeconomic status, and have worse diet than non-smokers. So increased heart attacks may be due to several factors, not just the cigarette smoking itself. One step down from the cohort studies are case control studies. Like cohort studies, case control studies are observational, studies designed to compare associations on the individual level. However, unlike cohort studies, participants are grouped based on outcome status, not exposure status. Because participants are picked, on, picked based on the presence or absence of the outcome, case control studies are always retrospective. Like cohort studies, case control studies are useful when RCTs are not feasible. However, they are most useful for assessing rare outcomes, like birth defects or rare cancers, or when relevant exposures are unknown. Case control studies are generally only thought to satisfy one causal criterion. Because patients are chosen after outcomes already occur, it can be difficult to make sure that the exposures actually proceeded and led to the development of the outcome of interest. For example, lung cancer can take years to form, and this can occur prior to starting cigarette smoking. These studies can also be hampered by recall bias. For example, if we asked scurvy and non-scurvy patients what they ate for the last month, maybe non-scurvy patients will overestimate their fruit consumption. For these reasons, it can be more difficult to infer causality. So if we wanted to run a case control study on, on our scurvy example, what we have is we've got our group of British soldiers, but now we're going to base, group them based on the outcome. So we're going to base whether or not they have scurvy. So we have a group of sailors with scurvy and a group of sailors without scurvy. And then we're going to look and see what they ate during that time or how much citrus fruits were reported and eaten by the non-scurvy patients versus those with scurvy. So strengths of the case control studies, they're especially useful when outcome of interest is rare and you are capable of drawing comparisons between groups, so there's a level of individual association. However, weaknesses are that it's retrospective, so it's reliant on pre-existing data. We're less certain that the cause or exposure precedes the effect or outcome. They're not randomized and they're vulnerable to selection bias, so it can be difficult to select a control group. Below case control studies are cross-sectional studies. Cross-sectional studies are observational studies which assess an outcome in a population at a particular point in time, although they can be analytical or descriptive. Time orientation is unique among cross-sectional studies because they assess exposures and outcomes at a single point in time. For example, a surveyor could come to your door and ask if you've ever been diagnosed with lung cancer and if you smoke cigarettes. In this case, we can't tell if smoking preceded your cancer diagnosis. These types of studies are usually done on very large numbers of people. Cross-sectional studies are always observational as investigators are simply recording information, not assigning treatments. Cross-sectional studies are useful for describing current states of practice using surveys or current states of disease or disease management with prevalence studies. Cross-sectional studies can give us some information about individual association if they use multiple groups. For example, if you know that the prevalence of scurvy is 70% on one ship and 40% on the other ship, and you also know the rates of citrus fruit consumption, you may be able to make individual associations. The strengths of the cross-sectional study is to describe the prevalence of diseases or of survey data across a large population. Although you cannot infer causality based on the study design, you can use it to inform further research and generate hypotheses. Weaknesses of cross-sectional studies are the inability to determine if the cause preceded the outcome because you're assessing both simultaneously. 
Finally, we arrive at the study designs with the lowest level of evidence, case reports and case series. Case reports and case series are simple descriptions of unique patient cases in the clinical setting. A case report is a description of a single patient case, whereas case series involve more than one patient case. For example, early cases of pneumocytosis gerovecci pneumonia were originally prescribed prescribed antibiotics in patients with very low white blood cell counts. These cases were written up and eventually PJP pneumonia was linked to AIDS patients. Because this was recognized early in subsequent studies attributed the disease to AIDS, we, know regular, we now regularly treat patients with antibiotics before they develop this condition because it's so deadly. Case reports and series are always descriptive and almost always retrospective, although in certain rare cases, like the experimental treatment of one patient with a new medication, it could be prospective. Case reports and series are simple descriptive studies to describe unique cases and unique phenomena. The results of the cases can be used to perform further research into a given topic, but these studies should never be used to infer causal relationships as they fulfill none of our causal criteria. In the context of our scurvy epidemic, a physician might write a unique case report in which one sailor with a lemon obsession is the only person on a ship to not develop scurvy. The physician might write up this unique finding and it might be used to justify future case control or cohort or randomized control trials to test whether a causal relationship actually exists between citrus fruits and scurvy. So some strengths for the case reports and case series, they're useful for describing new phenomena and they're useful for, for generating new hypotheses. Besides from not being able to draw causal inferences, case reports and case series are also subject to publication bias. Publication bias is the predisposition of academic journals to avoid publishing anything that is not sensational or groundbreaking. This can lead journals to avoid publishing less sensational research, especially related to negative findings, even if it is potentially impactful. This is a simple algorithm to determine which type of study design is employed in a particular research article. So take away from today's lectures, you should be able to understand the three basics of causal relationships, experimentation, cause preceding effect, and individual association, understand the major methods of classification of research studies, so intent, time orientation, investigator orientation, and group selection differences between cohort and case control studies. And then finally, you should know the major differences between the five study designs discussed, randomized controlled trials, cohort studies, case control studies, cross-sectional studies, and case series.